Hello, this is the video for 14.3, which is change of variables, um, polar coordinates. And um, so just be sure that you read through the lecture slides. And then once you've read over those and the examples contained in there, then come over to this video uh, to kind of guide you through the uh, assignment, okay? So the questions do change depending on um, the people, so the graphs may be different, or um, if you notice the things, numbers in red, they might be different, okay? So we definitely want to explain all of the process that's going on here. So I did already do this uh, assignment. I noticed that, and I should have remembered, but with chapter 14 and chapter 15, it really does take a long time personally to, um, map out the problem and talk it out and explain it. Now for me to do it, I mean, I can do it pretty quickly, but for me to explain everything that I'm doing, it takes some time. So normally it might take me um, about 20 to 30 minutes to do the actual assignment. Whereas when I'm having to see it for the first time, decipher it all in my head, explain that all out to you on paper, um, and then all the writing, of course, it takes a long time. And so the videos are starting to, to, to more of them are starting to pass over that hour threshold of my videos taking way too long, okay? I don't want to have folks sitting here for two hours listening to how to do one homework assignment and then you haven't even gone in there and done it yet, right? Um, it, I'm just trying to be considerate of you guys' time, okay? So what I did is I think from now on, I'm gonna go ahead and just prepare these um, assignments ahead of time. And then that way, all I have to do is walk you through it and, and explain what I have written, okay? So it shouldn't take as much time because I'm just explaining what's already written. I don't have to write it. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to compute anything anymore. So it should, I'm hoping, <laughs> will help me save some time. Um, so instead of the lectures being like an hour and a half, um, maybe I'll be able to keep it down to 45 minutes or less, okay? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start with number one. And I did already do all the assignments. So this is the same problems that you see on my paper. I did not click um, new randomization or anything like that. So it's the same exact problems. Um, and so for the first one, it says that the region R for this integral um, is shown and it's a state whether you would use rectangular or polar coordinates to evaluate the integral. And so I just drew the image over here and I wrote down, since the boundaries of R, right, R is my region, can be expressed using equations, so that should be equations, in the rectangular system. And those equations are simple equations, meaning easy to integrate. Um, it would be best to use rectangular coordinates. And so then in this case, my boundaries can be written in rectangular coordinates as y equal to zero, y equal to five, x equal to zero, and x equal to four, okay? And so then you notice that over there on the computer, I selected um, rectangular coordinates. Now for number two, it's got a different region, but it's the same directions. It says the region R is shown, um, state whether you would use rectangular coordinates or um, polar coordinates to evaluate this. Now this one, although it might seem like it's difficult, it's actually pretty easy because that function, well, it's, first of all, it's not a function um, because it doesn't pass the vertical line test, but that image is what's called a cardioid. Okay, and that's, you would have learned that in pre-calculus, okay? So in cardioids, um, those cannot be expressed using an equation in a rectangular system. You wouldn't, you would have to come up with a function, uh, maybe for this hump, another function for this hump, and then a whole nother function for this part, because this part is pretty much a circle. It just doesn't go all the way around like a full circle, right? it kind of dips in there, making it kind of look like a sideways heart, um, which is why it got the name cardioid. Um, so in this case, you don't have really an option. There's no way to express that boundary of the region using a rectangular equation, okay? 
So then in that case, that means we, we would have to use polar coordinates. And so notice over there, I did select polar coordinates because this would require, and I have the wrong word here. Um, since it cannot be expressed using an equation in the rectangular system, then it would be best to use polar coordinates. So we're gonna write here polar coordinates. There we go. Um, and then if you wanted to know the equation for that particular function, because it does go to 10, the center, if, if it were a circle, right? If it were a complete circle um, all the way around, the center is actually five and it goes out to zero and then it goes out to 10, okay? Normally it's double whatever this entry is over here or half of whatever this number is over here. So uh, I'm mentioning this because if you have a cardioid and your uh, cardioid doesn't go all the way to 10, let's say it went to six, then your coefficient right here would be a three, okay? If you have a cardioid and your cardioid hits the x-axis, I call this the butt of it, but <laughs> whatever, if the, the right-hand side of this um, cardioid were further along, like maybe it was at 16, then this number right here would be eight, okay? So it'd always be half of that number. Um, so that's where I got this equation from, again, you know, you can go review your pre-cal information about cardioids and limitations and all of them other um, different shapes that we talked about in um, polar coordinates in pre-cal. Um, but for now, this is this is enough for me. So I'm just going to run with that. Okay. Um, now, for this next one, uh, what is number three? Ask us. Number three says for us to evaluate the double integral, which I can do pretty easily. So I chose to do that afterward, not first. Um, but what I really wanted to concentrate on was where they said sketch the region R, okay? So they want me to evaluate it, then they want me to sketch the region. And to me, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at integrals. I was like, that's not the part where I'm gonna be a little iffy on. The part where I'm gonna be iffy on is the graphs, right? And it's usually the case with most people. So, um, I went ahead and did the graph first just to get the hard stuff out of the way and then I can do the easy stuff afterward, okay? Um, in this case, notice that my bounds are from the, okay, this is the best way that I look at it. But if you look at it like this, your variable is R. So R equals zero and then R equals this seven cosine of zero. Now my brain did not remember what seven cosine of zero looks like in polar coordinates. So I had to draw it real quick um, and then just use my information about that stuff from pre-cal to kind of figure it out thoroughly, okay? And so what I did was is it's telling me that the theta is gonna go from zero to pi. So I made a chart here and put theta and then seven cosine of theta. And I picked only thetas that were in that interval from zero to pi. So when I plugged in zero into this function, I got seven. So that meant when my angle is zero, um, so I'm here, when my angle is zero, I'm here. And then, uh, but my radius is seven units. So that means I'm on this axis right here where theta is zero, actually it's going that way. Um, but my R is positive seven, so it's right here. This is the point um, zero seven, okay? Then I plugged in pi over four for cos for theta and evaluated this and I got 4.9, about 4.9. And so then pi over four is actually, um, I don't know why that points way over there. It should be over here somewhere. But if you think of it this way, this is, no, that's pi over four because this is pi over two, right? So right in the middle there, if you cut the ax this uh, rectangle in half diagonally, right? You cut that diagonally, that's the line theta equals pi over four. And it goes over here too. But from the center, right? I'm either gonna go this way or this way, depending on R. R is 4.9, which means I'm gonna go the length of 4.9, which is why I ended up here, okay? Then pi over two and zero, 
So now you're talking about this is the line that you'll be existing on. And since the length is zero, that lands me right on top of the origin. And then this one, when I plugged in three pi over four, well, three pi over four is actually the same line as pi over four, okay? I just don't know if my radius is gonna be, or no, I'm sorry, three pi over four is over here. Three pi over four is in this quadrant. So bear with me while I try to draw it. Um, but this is theta equal to three pi over four. So if my radius is positive, I will go in this direction. But if my radius is negative, I'm gonna go in the opposite direction, okay? And I did get a negative 4.9 radius, which means I'm gonna go this direction 4.9 units. And that's why I ended up in this spot. Again, these are all polar coordinates, not X and Y coordinates, okay? Um, then the last one, pi, well, pi is the X axis. And if it's a positive R, I'm gonna go in this direction, but if it's in a negative R, I'm gonna go in that direction. And it was a negative seven. And I actually ended up at the same spot where the zero seven was, right? And we know from pre-cal that there are about four representations for the same point, okay? Because I could also use two pi and seven, or I could use um, a negative pi and, uh, negative seven or negative pi and seven. It is just a bunch of different variations that you could use to get to that same spot, okay? Um, and then not to mention if you do multiples, right? Two pi multiples of all of these, they land you in the same spot as well. So really it's not just four representations. It's like possibly an infinite number of representations to get the same point, the same location, okay? Um, so, with that said, I went ahead and plotted the points. This was the first one I plotted. This was the second one I plotted. So I kind of drew a curve to connect those. This was the third one I plotted. So I connected that one. This was the fourth one. So I connected it. And then that was the fifth one. So I connected it. And it did make this, Z, this circle image, OK? And since those were my bounds, I just went ahead and filled in the entire region that got created, OK? So it is a circle. And notice that it's it, it has a center here, really in the middle, whatever half of seven is, which is of it about 3.5. So it has a center at 3.5. Um, and then it has an X coordinate in the coordinate system. Now the tip top of this in the court, uh, rectangular coordinates. So I graphed it in polar coordinates, right? I was imagining polar um, graph. But if I want to convert that over to a, a rectangular coordinate system, um, that's not going to change this, uh, this number here or that number there or that number there. That on an x and y coordinate system is still 0 and still 7. However, I know that since this is a circle, this uh, just like this is seven units uh, across, I know that this is seven units across. So I know that this point is gonna be down here at negative 3.5, and this peak up here is gonna be at positive 3.5, okay? Since that is uh, essentially like the radius of the circle. So if you look at these images, this is the only image that kind of matches my image, okay? Now, this next problem, Oh, I didn't evaluate, right? I said, I'll, I could do that. That's the easy part, right? But I didn't do it. Or at least I didn't talk it out. So I did go ahead and do what was in the red first. So when I integrate R with respect to R, I got R squared over two. And then I kept my bounds for R. I plugged in seven cosine theta and I plugged in zero over here. And of course, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, I put the subtraction in between. Um, then this became 49 cosine squared over two. And then this is just one big zero, okay? So then now when I took this, I took the 49 over two on the outside and I only had cosine squared on the inside. From the strategies in Cal two, um, we learned some uh, ways to, to integrate trigonometric functions, right? And one of them is, is if you have an odd power then you split one with the square and one with the, um, uh, a one power. But 
This one is not an odd power, it's an even power. And the strategy for an even power is to actually convert it using the power reducing formulas. So cosine of squared theta is actually equal to this fraction here. And notice that I now have a double angle, okay? And then what I did was I took, since this two is in the denominator, I took it out to the front and that's how it became 49 over four. And then that means I no longer have that denominator there, okay? Now I did split this integral. So I did do the integral of one plus the integral of cosine of two theta. But while I was splitting it, I also went ahead and did the u substitution. So um, I let u equal that double angle. So then du would be two d theta. And then if I divide by two, I get that du over two is d theta. So I replaced the two theta with the u and I replaced the d theta with the du over two. Now I'm gonna flip my page. So then when I integrate one, I get theta. And when I integrate cosine of u over two, I just get a negative sine of u over two. Now remember that this is theta. Theta equals this and theta equals this. So I do have to back sub for u before I can plug in the pi and the zero. So 49 over four stayed the same, theta stayed the same, minus, and then I replaced the u with the two theta. And so then um, now I'm gonna replace everybody with pi. So I end up with this expression, replace the thetas with zero. I end up with this expression. And here I have pi, sine of two pi is zero and zero over two is still zero. Minus zero, that would be a plus. Sine of zero is zero over two is still zero. So I end up with 49 over four times pi, which gave me this response here. And it did turn out to be correct. Um, number four. So number four, again, I had to graph in polar coordinates, right? Um, and it looks like because they have pi over two up here that these graphs are in polar coordinates. They're not in, um, well, they're like rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates all together in one. So it really doesn't matter. Um, so what I did was I did the same thing again, is I kind of grouped this first integral together. And then the second integral um, is on the outside, okay? So the variable of integration here is r. So r is equal to four, a zero and r is equal to four, which means r is going from zero to four. And then here, theta equals zero and theta equals pi over four. So what I did was, is I took, um, if the angle is zero, okay, so here's what's happening. If the angle is zero, you're talking about this. This is where theta is equal to zero, okay? And then here, this line, your theta is equal to another value. Here, your theta is equal to another value. Here, your theta is equal to another value until you get to theta equal to pi over four, okay? So if I were to be just shading in the region as theta goes from zero to pi over four, it would essentially cover up this entire infinite cone-like structure and then this entire infinite cone-like structure. However, it limits me based on the radius. The radius is only going from zero to four. So my radius going from zero is here, it would just be the point, zero, zero. But if my radius were one, then it would be positive one. It means I'm only going out this way and then either up to this theta, this theta, this theta, all the way up to that theta. And so it fills in everything here. But it might not necessarily be one. It might be something smaller than one and it's gonna fill up all of this area in between, okay? Or for instance, if I put my radius as positive four, that puts me out here. And then if my theta is here, 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 anywhere, all the way up to pi over four. But again, my radius could have been anything from zero to four. So then essentially what happens is that all of these pieces are getting shaded in, okay? Um, and so then what you end up with is this kind of like uh, sector image here, and it's in the first quadrant. And notice that the height of it, when I drew it on my graph paper with all these little curves and stuff, the height of this little sector is exactly three units in rectangular coordinates, okay? And so that looks exactly like this image where you see that little peak at three, okay? 
and it's just coincidence that that's where it ended up, but that is where it ended up, okay? Now, let's see. Oh, now I have to evaluate. I have to evaluate it to get this number. So what I did was, is I, this is just like a constant. So I integrated R squared with respect to R and I got R cubed over three. So I plugged in the four, plugged in the zero and I got 64 over three minus zero. And I took the 64 over three out of the other integral. And then if I already have this, so I took a sine of theta is U and then DU would be cosine of theta D theta. And since I already have both pieces, the integral essentially just becomes a u du. So you end up with u squared over two. But remember, these are thetas. So I have to back sub what u was, okay? And since u was sine and this is u squared, I ended up with sine squared theta. And instead of writing over two inside this bracket, I put it out with the three. So now it's 64 over six and 64 over six can reduce. So I got 32 over three. And then now I plugged in the pi over four and then I plugged in the zero. So the sine of pi over four is actually one over four or I'm sorry, it's square root of two over two. And then when I squared square root of two over two, I got one half. And then the sine of zero is zero and zero squared is zero. So 32 over one times three over two is actually 16 over three. And so that was the answer I typed in and it was correct. Now for number five, um, same thing, we gotta figure out the region and then we can figure out the, um, the integration, okay? So since my R here, again, I still like to kind of group this together so you can see everything. Um, so in this one, I group this. So here R is going from zero to three and theta is going from zero to pi over two. So it's essentially the same thing, right? I'm going from zero to three, right? My uh, radius is three, zero to three, but I'm only going, I'm going, my angles are going from zero to pi over two which means no matter what the R is from zero to three, I'm always going to that uh, Y axis, that positive Y axis. And so you see, that's how I ended up shading all of this sector. But the sector actually is a sector in the whole quadrant, right? Not just the bottom half of the first quadrant. So when I'm putting that in, in uh, uh, my integral, so I already have the image. It's basically a sector in the first quadrant, which is this image down here. And when we integrated, um, we're integrating with respect to R. So I noticed I had an E with an R in it upstairs. So I let U equal that uh, exponent. And then when I take DU, I get negative two R dr D theta. I'm sorry, DR, why do I have D theta? That is a typo. It should be two R DR. And so then when I divide by negative two on both sides, I get that du over negative two will replace the r dr. So I circled the r and dr because that together is going to become the du over negative two. And then the exponent negative r squared is going to become u. And so that's what you see here, okay? Now that this is like this, this is a negative two in the denominator. So I put it, instead of taking it out of this integral, it's just a constant regardless of whether I'm integrating with respect to R or theta, it's still just a constant. So I went ahead and moved it out here, okay? Um, and I'm actually, yeah, no, we're good. So let me keep my little brackets here. And so I moved it out, not just out of here, but I moved it all the way to the front. And so that's where this negative one half came from. And then the integral of e to the u du is actually just e to the u but my bounds are for R. So I had to back sub what U was, right? Um, U was negative R squared. So I had to put that back in and then I can plug these numbers in for R. And so I ended up with E to the negative nine minus E to the zero. 
And when I simplify that, I still have the negative one half. I still have my integral, e to the negative nine, but e to the zero is just one, okay? Now this is one giant constant as well. So I just brought it out with this in my brain. So I have the negative one half times this constant and the integral of d theta is just theta. And I have to evaluate it from zero to pi over two. So I plugged in pi over two, I plugged in zero, and then I ended up with negative pi over four and then times e to the negative nine minus one. And I typed that in there and it did accept it. So I didn't simplify this any further than that. That was the final answer. Okay, moving on, number six. So number six didn't ask me to graph anything and I don't think any of them do after this. Okay, so it's just the beginning ones where we had to graph. Now we don't have to graph, but if you notice in my pictures, I do graph all of them because I have to visually understand what I'm doing. Otherwise I can't do it, okay? Some people can do it, but then they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. And I have to know why I'm doing it. Otherwise, I just don't believe you that that's what I should be doing. <laughs> well, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? That's just the way I work. Um, most people can just like, here, this is how it works, do it. And they do. Um, but for me, when it comes to all of this area and volume and stuff, I really have to be able to visualize it. Now I will get to a point where I can't visualize it. Um, but while I still can, I always make an attempt to do that, okay? And especially for these, because they're asking me to convert it into polar coordinates. And I really have to know what the picture looks like in order for me to convert it into polar coordinates, okay? So this is what I did. I saw this integral like this, and I said, okay, my variable is x. So x equals zero and x equals this. And if I manipulate this equation, I can square both sides. And then I can move the y over and I have x squared plus y squared equal to nine, which I know is a circle with radius three centered at zero, right? Um, so I, I originally drew the whole circle, but um, notice it's only going from zero to the positive root, not the negative root, right? Because if I were to take this equation and try to solve for x, I would have to minus the y squared on both sides. And then I would have to take the square root to get x all alone. Well, we already know that when we take the square root, you get positive and negative, but they only used the positive. That means that they're only talking about the right half of the circle. Why is it the right half and not the top half, you might ask, right? Because x is equal to this positive radical, which means this is where the x values are positive, okay? And so that's why I didn't take the top half, because top half would be when the y values are positive. Um, so then that was this uh, section here. So I only drew this half circle and I erased the other half because I was not concerned with that other half according to the bounds for X, okay? But then I moved on and I talked about the bounds for Y. So I thought about the bounds for Y, Y equals zero, Y equals three. That basically means I'm starting at Y equals three and I'm stopping, I mean at zero and I'm stopping at Y equals three which means I'm filling in all of this space up until the y value equals three. So it wasn't even the whole right half of the circle. It was actually only the part of the circle in the first quadrant, okay? So then I tried to put that in terms of polar coordinates, okay? And we've seen sectors in polar coordinates already in the first few problems, okay? So my radius is obviously going from zero to positive three, right? And as it rotates around, it's still zero to positive three, okay? And then how far is it rotating? The angle at which it rotates is from zero and then it rotates all the way till it gets to pi over two. And so that's how I knew that theta was going from zero to pi over two. So then we already know that if you saw the, the, the lecture slides that when you convert dx dy into polar coordinates, you get r dr d theta, okay? We'll talk about more about that and why it happens when we get to Jacobians, which is later, okay? Um, but we will explain that more. And then the lecture slides try to explain it a little bit, but it really does get explained a whole lot better later, okay? Um, and, then, and then I know that six Y is the Y is actually can be written as R sine of theta, right? So 
I know how to replace every single one of these pieces. I know how to replace my bounds using the polar bounds. I know how to replace, replace my uh, variables of integration by using this instead. And I even know what to replace 6y with. I'll replace it with 6r sine theta. So I just put in my bounds for theta, put in my bounds for r, put in the expression for 6y, and then put in the expression for dx dy. Then I went ahead and put the r's, multiplied them together. And so I got 6r squared sine theta dr d theta. This acts like a constant. This is the variable of integration. So I did six and then r cubed over three and the sine theta just tagged along because it's like a constant. Um, three does go into that twice. So I have a two here. Um, and then I did go ahead and plug in my three and my zero. So I ended up three cubed minus zero. Now three cubed is 27, 27 times two is where this 54 came from. And the sine of theta is still there, d theta is still there. Then the integral of sine theta is negative cosine theta, and I still have my bounds in theta. So I plugged in pi over two, and I plugged in zero, and cosine of pi over two is zero, cosine of zero is one, negative 54 times a negative one is where we got positive 54. Moving on. Okay, so for number seven. Number seven, again, uh, my eyes always see it like this. And so then here, my variable is y. So y is equal to zero, y is equal to this up here. And again, I could manipulate this into y squared equal to 36 minus x squared, which is x squared plus y squared equal to 36. And so I know that it's a circle with radius equal to six and then center, center at zero, zero, right? So I did originally draw the whole circle, but I erased the bottom half of the circle because Notice that this only gave me the positive radical, which means I only want where the y is positive. And that happens to be where the y is positive, the top half, okay? Now my x variable, the bounds are x equals negative six and x equals six. So if the x values are going from negative six to six, well, that's from all the way over here to all the way over there. And so it's actually the whole thing until I reach the top of this circle, okay? So in polar coordinates though, in polar coordinates, I know that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. I also know that dy dx is equal to r dr d theta. We also know that uh, in this image, my radius is from zero to six. It doesn't matter which direction, okay? And then my angle is going from zero, right? So I have my radius here, zero to six. So I'm filling up all of this. And no matter what my angle is, I'm going to fill it up that line, like little lines, basically, all the way across. But if there's a bunch of little lines all in here and a bunch all in here, you just end up filling up the whole space, right? If you just keep going all the way until you get to x equal to, or pi equal to, sorry, theta equal to pi. It literally goes all the way around. I'm trying to draw it as best as I can, but you get the idea. So it does go from zero to pi. So then I replaced it. It's r dr d theta for dy dx. Um, it's r squared for the x squared plus y squared. And since dr is on the inside, I put my r zero to six and then d theta is on the outside. I put the zero to pi on the outside. And then I just multiplied these two r's together and got r cubed. And so that's what I typed. This is the integral that I typed into the answer boxes for number seven. Then I went ahead and did the integration. So I get R4 over four, plug in the four, or plug in the six and then plug in the zero. This is just zero. This happens to be 324. Integrate this with respect to theta is gonna be 324 theta. Plug in the pi, plug in the zero, we get this. And then I end up with 324 pi. Now, moving on for number eight, okay? Number eight has the same similar thing. It has dy on the inside. So y is equal to zero. Y is equal to this. 
we know that that is again y squared equal to 4 minus x squared or x squared plus y squared equal to 4 which is a center with a radius of equal to 2 and a center at 0 0. So I did originally draw the whole thing but I noticed that y was only given the positive radical so that means where the y values are positive would be the top half of the circle okay then the x's went from 0 to 2. So I was only allowed to go from here to here. So when I shaded it in, I'm still bounded by that uh, graph. I end up with this sector in the first quadrant. So um, if we take that and we put it in polar coordinates, again, my r is still going from 0 to 2, but my angle is going from 0 to pi over 2. And so then I converted the x squared plus y squared is r squared. The dy dx is r dr d theta, and I crossed over. So r dr d theta, x squared plus y squared becomes r squared, raised to the 3 halves power. And then since dr is on the inside, my r went from 0 to 2, and theta is on the outside, so theta goes from 0 to pi over 2. And then I just cleaned up this power. When you multiply 2 times 3 halves, you just get a 3 power. Oh, no. You do get a three power here, you get an R cubed, but then that R cubed times this R is where we got an R to the fourth power. And so that's why I typed in R to the fourth power um, in the computer here, okay? Then we have to evaluate this. So, excuse me, it's early in the morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> I drank a tiny bit of coffee, but I guess not enough, anyway. Um, so if I integrate r to the fourth power, I'm going to get r to the fifth over five. And then I'm going to plug in the two. So I get 32 over five. I'm going to plug in zero. I get zero over five or just zero. So I brought the 32 out. The integral of d theta is 32 over five times theta evaluated at your bounds. So I plugged in pi over two, plugged in zero. And then I reduced this and I ended up with 16 pi over five. So this unit really is strengthening our ability to convert between polar coordinates and rectangular coordinates, which is a bunch of stuff you did at the end of um, pre-cal, but we're trying to bring it back, okay? And also um, all of your, uh, like we saw some weird trick thing, right, where we had to use the power reducing formulas. So they're bringing back all of those um, integration uh, techniques back as well from Cal 2, okay? So, <laughs> what is this one? Okay, last one, number nine. So we've got zero to four, zero to this, x, y, dy, dx. This one was a little bit more complicated, okay? So it's y equals a zero because the y is on the inside. So the variable is y, y equals a zero, y equals to this. I squared both sides. I, min I added the x over, I minus the 4x over, so now I have zero over here. Then I went ahead and completed the square here. So um, negative four over two is negative two, squared is four. So I added four and subtracted four to keep the problem equivalent, right? And then here I completed the square, and so I get x minus two squared, and then I move this four over, and so I have this. What is this? This is a circle with a, with a radius of two and the center of two and zero, which is what I have here. However, since they only gave me y equal the positive radical of this, that means it's the top half where the y is zero, y is positive. Um, so I only shaded up there, okay? I didn't even shade first. I only graphed the circle on the top half, okay? What do I shade though? It says to shade from x equal to zero to x equal to four. And so in this boundary, if I have x equal to zero to x equal to four, that is going to shade all of this, okay? And so that is what I've got so far. Now, I remembered that in number three, we had a circle kind of like this shape, okay? I know it looks more like a lemon, but whatever. <laughs> it's supposed to be a circle. Um, it has to do with the fact that I think I made these things too. Um, I don't know, it just looks weird to me. But anyway, um, I remember that when they had a circle like this, instead of it being centered at the origin, it was shifted over here. 
Um, instead of putting the two right here, what they did in the, um, uh, oh, what is it called? In number three, look, let's go back and look at number three. Notice that it was uh, R equal to this seven cosine theta. And notice what it did is it put a circle over here and it went all the way to seven, okay? I have a circle over there, but my circle over there, this circle over here, I have a circle over here. Again, I don't know, it doesn't really look like a circle at this side that's shorter than this one, but whatever. You get the idea, it's supposed to be a circle. Um, it ends at four, not at seven, okay? So for my equation, I have to have a four cosine of theta, okay? And if it's four, that means my center here, well, we know that the center is at two, okay, of this circle. Now, however, so that helps me. R equal to zero is the center. And then if R equals to one, I'm here. R equal to two, R equal to three, or not even R because R starts here at the center. So R's going this way, okay? But it can go backwards as well. So to represent that the radius is going backwards and forward, you basically just go from zero, which is here, um, or the center, and then the radius goes all the way out to this graph. And it'll go all the way out here, all the way up there, all the way there. You get the idea, right? I'm mean, I could draw a million lines in between and it would shade it all in, but I don't even know yet how far I'm gonna go. I just know that I have this boundary, okay? And it's represented by R equal to zero to four cosine theta. Now, I only wanna shade the top half because that's what they shaded in the rectangular coordinates. So that means that my angle has to go from here all the way around, um, well, actually no, because if I were to put um, a table, we did it in a, in a number three, okay? But if I wanna get just between just this part, I actually have to just do zero to pi over two. We saw that when we had seven cosine theta, when we did zero to pi, it actually shaded the whole thing, okay? And I don't wanna shade the whole thing, I just wanna shade the top, okay? So you plug in the first X, the, you plug in zero for theta, you'll get this point. You plug in pi over four for theta, you'll get this point up here. You plug in um, pi over two for theta, you'll get here. And if you stop, that's it. So you went from here to here to here. So all of these radius is moving in this direction are also going all the way around, okay? And that's covered, you, you've got everything covered. So you just need to go for theta, just needs to go zero to pi over two and R needs to go from zero to four cosine theta. We also know that dy dx converts into R dr d theta. And we know for x, y, we have R cosine theta times R sine theta, which is R squared cosine theta sine theta. So I replace the x, y with the R squared cosine theta sine theta. I replace the dy dx with R theta, R dr d theta. I put the r from zero to four cosine and the theta zero to pi over two. So then we started to uh, simplify this. So I have r squared and r, so I put r cubed. This is like a constant multiplier, so it stayed. Integrate with respect to r, that's gonna be r four over four. Um, and then I plug in the zero, the bounds. So um, I did take this as a one fourth out to the front. So I have all my coefficients here. And then um, when I plug in uh, four cosine theta, I ended up with 256 cosine to the fourth power theta. And when I plugged in zero, I ended up with zero over four, which is just zero, which means I didn't need to subtract anything in here, okay? Um, and then there's my d theta, I tried to smush it in there. So if I multiply this out, I took this and this out to the front, and 256 divided by four is 64. Then cosine of the fourth times cosine is cosine to the fifth, and we have our sine. So we did u as cosine of theta, 
du would be negative sine of theta d theta. So then that means du over negative one is sine theta d theta. So this part will become the du over negative one. And then this part um, would become u. So it end up being u to the fifth. So over here, we have that substitution happening. We get u to the fifth, du over negative one and 64. I brought the negative one out. So 64 divided by negative one is negative 64. Um, and then I still need to integrate u to the fifth. U to the fifth is gonna be u to the sixth over six. Again, your theta going from zero to pi over two. So I had to back sub and put back in what u was and u was cosine of theta. So I have cosine of theta to the sixth power. So I first plugged in pi over two and then I plugged in zero. So cosine of pi over two is zero, cosine of zero is one. Zero to the sixth power is zero, one to the sixth power is one. And so zero minus one is negative one. And negative three halves or negative 32 over three times negative one is where we got this positive um, 32 over three, okay? Um, and that was the very end of this one. So I plugged in my bounds, I plugged in after I simplified my, um, what I was gonna take the integral of, integrand is what they call it, an integrand, um, kind of like a radicand integrand. It's just what you're gonna take the square root of and what you're gonna take the integral of. So my integrand was cosine theta, sine theta, r cubed. And after I did all the computations, I ended up with 32 over three, okay? So I'm not sure how long this video has run. I think less than an hour, but pretty close. But that is a lot less compared to how long it would have been if I had to think it out. And it's just, trust me, <laughs> I saved you some time. And I'm gonna keep doing it this way to hopefully um, help with that regard, okay? But I'll see you in the next video.